Let me um, let me ask John Troy to speak. I see he's got his hand raised, and I just love having him here. Uh, he's a dear friend and a, a man of wisdom. So, um, John, you've got the floor. I'm, I'm a person, and I've had lots of incredible experiences in my life. No two alike, but the flower has bloomed in miraculous ways, and the brain is, and the universe is spectacular, to say the least. But I, I'd like to share something with you that has recently happened with me. Uh, I'm 78 years old. And I've uh, had congestive heart failure. And a month ago, my heart rate started to slow down and it stopped. And uh, so they had to keep me alive. I hit him with a defibrillator every two seconds in the ambulance. And then when I got to the emergency room, there was a scalpel ready to cut into my jugular vein to get an electrical wire down in there to get the heart to do something. And I found that I, uh, I found the whole thing interesting. At no point did I seem to be really scared. It was just all very interesting. Uh, but yesterday I, I met with with my heart doctor, and we were reviewing the thing. And I asked him, I said, <laughs> was, how, how close a call was that?" And he laughed, and he said, "It, it wasn't close." In intensive care, you had flat lines. That means not. And as I, I shared right after that happened, uh, it was like there, there was no tunnels of light or no Messiah waiting for me. Or, uh, I mean, it was an utter not. film out of a movie and splice the two ends together like there was no duration when I was flatlined. Wow. Uh, that's probably as close to non-duality as you can get because it was just absolutely nothing, yet profoundly benign. So you, you don't get any closer than that. All the electrical signals have stopped. Uh, now I'm run by artificial intelligence. Uh, it's, it's not an assist. They got a, a, a pacemaker right in, right in here. And it, it's what they call totally pacing. So I only have one heartbeat. It, if I get excited or something, or or even extremely relaxed, my heart doesn't slow down or speed up or anything. It's like a better diet. And there's a box in my bedroom that connects with a data center at Duke, and it tweaks it every day. But the electrical signals are gone. Just not there anymore. Um, I feel good. I feel amazingly good. Uh, but that, what somebody might call a near-death experience or a death experience, wasn't an experience. It was. It wasn't anything. It was just not like forever before being born or something. And there's there's no knower or knowledge or anything about it. For me, I mean, that's just, just my own confession about it. And, and this is from one who has 
uh, been in a lot of altered states of consciousness in my life, which I, I consider like flowers blooming, but flowers wither and fall off. So I would venture based on my personal experience and non-experience that all these afterlife scenarios, all of them, uh, are false. That's that would be my confession, and I think in uh, accepting mortality rather than looking into that tunnel, into that bardo you speak of, when that's really closed, that's death and resurrection, accepting death, accepting death is resurrection as current reality, as now. And, and that's really beautiful and uh, with no escape hatches. I, I know Jesus supposedly said, uh, well, they were reasoning one time, oh, we need to go to a funeral. And, and he said, let the dead bury the dead. Because it's the idea of death, burying the idea of death and all these things about where it's going and have a good journey. And uh, it, there's a lot of this stuff going on these days in the New Age spiritual crowd about reincarnation and karma. Well, karma assumes there's some, that the narrator is for real and, and there's a judge on it. And, and <laughs> if you do something bad, you're going to get, you're going to have to pay for it. Uh, uh, and it's another doctrine of sin to be discarded along with the Christian doctrines of sin or any, any other doctrines of sin, all this, that stuff came out of us. And all, a lot of that mythology came out of a caste system in India. They put the Brahmins on the top and then the warrior class, and then you got the merchant class, and then you got the lower the lots, the lower caste, and then you got the people who can't even make it into a caste called the outcast. And, and, the, and the Brahmins, the guru class over there, keeps all this in line so they can stay on top. And it's bullshit. And, and a lot of these after life scenarios are embedded in, in those mythologies. And uh, it, it's another doctrine of sin that I would say you're better off without. And uh, so trying to know about death based upon experiences when you're living those are living experiences and they're really far out and they're beautiful and everything. And no one, no one's denying that. But the conjecture of taking that and forcing it into something when you're dead and gone uh, uh, only prevents you from closing the escape hatches, which will br bring you the maximum amount of beauty into your life. And that, and that impermanency that, that truly is beauty. So. Thank you, John. It's a great statement. The, uh, the explanation of how all this judgmental religion and such has always been in the service of the, uh, the top dogs. You, you said that in the last Zoom, I heard it then, and you've repeated it again. I guess that's really the core of, of the objection to all of this chit chat, because it's always designed to uh, keep the pot boiling for somebody. Whereas a moment of uh, understanding has a price beyond rubies.
It's what everybody really wants. A moment of contact with this world. For real, not through filters. Is what I think many of us are seeking in, in spirituality. And what I'm trying to say is it's not there, it's here. So thank you for that, John. <laughs>